Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to be taking an in-depth look at the Roland MC707. So if we want to continue editing this drum kit that we started building previously, there are so many settings that we can use to customize the sound, aside from just swapping out different parts and preset, um, preset drum kit sounds. Let's keep working from where we were. Going into the main editing menu, holding shift and pressing sound, what you'll see along the bottom here, this top level screen, are some very fundamental and uh, important parameters to change for any type of drum sound. So if we're looking at our kick drum here, what we see is level. Now this is very important as leveling out your different drum kit, uh, drum kit hits is gonna be so important for having a nice feeling kit. What's great about this is as I move through any pad, I can just turn down the level like this and level things out in real time. Also, of course, I can be doing any of this while the drum sequence is running. So we've got level, we've got coarse tune. So that's, of course, a very powerful way to change something like a kick from a 606 kick, for example, is not necessarily the most bassy kick. And that's why we have it turned down to negative three coarse tune right away. Now, also, there's release settings, which would be, if we look at our open hi-hat, for example, essentially our release or sometimes more referred to as decay for drum sounds. So the timing of that sound. So we can really tighten it up. If you push down on the encoders while you're turning, you're gonna increase or decrease by greater values as well. So let's add a little bit of that open hat into the sequence. And then increase the release. So you can hear that last one is releasing nice and long until it's choked by the closed hi-hat. And we'll get into more mute groups after. If we keep moving on down, you see we have reverb send. And then if we function over to the next screen, we have fine tune, panning, our envelope mode, and delay send. So panning is great for creating more of a stereo image with your drum kit. If you wanna put your different symbols in different spots, just like you were miking a real drum kit, or if you wanna get extra creative with it and have some interesting sounds in the left and the right, however you want to use that is up to you. But I'd like to point out that the effect send, so what we're seeing here is reverb and delay, those are individual per part. Now, you can set those per part, but you still need to send the entire drum kit to that effect. So the reason that we've had it set up this way is because if I want to use either one of the control knobs or some of the deeper settings to send a drum kit to a reverb or delay, I often don't want to send things like my kick drum to a reverb or a delay, but maybe I just want to send my clap or my percussion to that effect. So as you can see, I could turn down the kick reverb. Now I'm gonna crank up some reverb on this drum kit and press play. So I've turned the kick down. So our kick shouldn't go through the reverb, but some other parts will. So you can hear that the snare is going to reverb. Maybe it's a little bit much. See, so each part I could turn it down. So snare and clap, let's take them right out of the reverb. Now you can hear the reverbs only affecting the cymbals that are playing. So that's just a tool for you to use to really get the sound of your kit sitting in a mix really nicely. So on the right side of the edit screen, you'll see that you can easily rename your drum kit. That's great if you wanna recall it later on another project. If you've spent a lot of time laying out a really great drum kit, tuning it up the way you like, you're gonna to wanna to be able to load that up later on future projects. You'll also see that there's an MFX section. So this is an MFX section no different than a tone track. And we'll get into how to program that more later on in the effects section of this video. But let's take a look at the settings for the whole drum kit. Now that's found right there. And you can see that you have some of the similar settings that you would have on a pad. So you have level of your drum kit, you have panning of your whole drum kit, which you may not use often, but say you, because you can have multiple drum tracks on this, you could have a drum kit just doing some really interesting percussion stuff on the left and another drum kit doing something weird on the right, if you wanted to, because then you have manual control over the level of each. That's really up to you as an artist. We also have 
the delay and reverb settings that I mentioned previously, which are the master sends for that drum kit. And remember, if you have the delay and reverb settings turned all the way down for any of your individual parts, they will not be sent to the effect with this parameter. Very important to remember. So let's now take a look at some of the deeper editing settings that we can do for the drum kit. And one of the important things to look at is what we call mute groups. So as we did when we were loading up a different sound per pad, let's simply highlight one of the pads here, or by pressing the pad itself, or by holding shift as a shortcut and pressing any of the pads, we can immediately jump to the screen we want to be on and pressing enter. So every single pad has a few, men a few different menus inside of it. So we have instrument select, which is where we were selecting which preset instrument we want. Then we have instrument edit, which we'll look at in a second, instrument name, pad edit, and instrument initialize. Let's take a look at pad edit because the pad behavior has a lot to do with each drum part and how it interacts. And here under control, is where we're going to find the mute groups. So mute groups are very important because as we saw with the open and close hi-hat, let's turn down our reverb, the close hi-hat is going to choke the open hi-hat immediately because we have a nice long release, but as soon as I play, it will interrupt as soon as I play the closed. And that's how we get that kind of open close hi-hat feel that we have going on on these two tracks. L allow me to mute the other parts and we'll just listen to those hi-hats. If I want to mute specific parts on a drum track, I just hold down mute and touch the pads just like this and we get a nice readout showing us if it's muted or not. So let's take a listen to the hats. And there, just as before, you can hear that interaction between mute groups. Now you can set up many different mute groups on the MC-707 drum tracks. We're only using one on this kit, but say I had a long sample of my own, as we'll get into later, uh, a synth sample maybe on this, and I wanted it to cut from another one. As you can see on the menu, we have up to 31 different mute groups that we can use. So we're only using one right now. So all that means is if I want two sounds to cancel each other, when the next one plays, I set them to the same mute group. Simple as that. I had mentioned that each drum track has its own MFX. Now, this can be a very powerful way to beef up a drum sound or get really creative with drum sounds. However, just like the reverb and delay sends, we don't always want every single part of the drum to go through the MFX. So in our menu here, which is pad edit for each pad, we have output assign. And output assign is where we can say, I want this kick drum to go out dry, directly to the output, or to the MFX. So let's set up a quick effect on the drum kit. Remember this is on the top level screen for our entire drum kit, shift and sound. Let's go to MFX, press enter, and this is, looks exactly like a tone track, same 90 effects to choose from. Let's just pick one, say an auto wah. Right? Very cool kind of sound for percussion, but the kick is essentially gone. It has no low end. It's just a little tick now. So I'm going to jump to my kick pad settings where I just was before. I'll take my shortcut shift kick pad. I'm going to press oh, move over to there and press enter. Let's go back to the pad menu and I'm gonna change the output assign from MFX to dry and you'll hear the difference immediately. Here we go. So now we've got the clap, snare, and the hi-hats running through that auto wah effect, but the kick is still punching nice down through the center and it maintains its frequency integrity. Let's go ahead and turn the MFX off for now. So remember we had mentioned that there are actually two types of drum instrument tracks on the MC-707. So let's set up an initial track just like we did before by choosing any blank track that's unlit, pressing select, and instead of selecting drum, let's select drum plus compressor. So I'm going to press enter 
and open this up. Let's just pick a preset kit. I'm gonna do a very quick sequence, maybe just something a little bit more straight ahead, four on the floor. And as I'm going, of course, I can change some of these very simple preset into a sound that I like a little bit better. Classic 3, 7, 11, 15. Let's take a listen. And I'll turn down my tempo a little bit. All right. So let's add a couple more parts with real time recording. And then what we're gonna do is take a look at what the compressors offer in this mode. Those are a little too loud. So right away, what I'm gonna be doing is turning down the volume of each of those pads. Much better. Because remember, we're gonna be dealing with compressors, so volume can be adjusted and manipulated in uh, some interesting dynamic ways afterwards. I'll just add one or two more sounds. I like this tambourine, just on 11 and 15. Let's take another look and maybe just find a rim shot. Or conga, even better. Let's go. Perfect. So now that we have a simple beat going, let's take a look at that same pad menu where we found the mute group assignments. So again, shift and sound were there, and I'm gonna choose my pad. Let's first choose our kick. Press enter, and under pad edit, you'll remember that the control screen has the output assign. So this is where we were just deciding if we wanted to go through uh, the MFX or not per part. But if I keep scrolling over, what you'll see is there's six compressors available. Each compressor can have its own group of instruments going to it. If I wanna say, send my kick to one compressor, I'm gonna send my clap and my snare both to another compressor because I want those to compress together. Kind of like, this is a, essentially a compressor bus. So I have six buses to work with. My two hi-hats, why don't we just go ahead and send them to compressor number three. Congas will go to compressor number four. And finally, we gotta send that tambourine to the same compressor as the hi-hats. So now that this is all set up, Let's take a look at that top level drum editing menu again, shift plus sound. You'll see it's different from the regular drum instrument because we have this new icon here that says comp. So if we press enter and open up our compressor menu, we've actually got six pages. So an individual compressor per compressor bus. So this is very powerful. So we wanna go in first and cursor down and turn each of these on. We only use four, but let's turn them all on. There's not very aggressive settings right away, so you won't hear a change as soon as you turn them on, but let's go through and make some, uh, some changes to a couple different parts. So now let's take a look at the individual settings per compressor. I'm gonna go ahead and mute everything but the kick drum, and we'll look at drum comp one, which is where we routed the kick drum through on the pad edit settings. We've already turned it on, and we have here pretty much all your standard compressor settings. So attack time, release time, threshold, ratio, knee, output gain, and output assign. Now remember that you had assigned the kick drum through this compressor, so from here is where we want to say, is this going to the MFX or drive? So just remember that we have the option at this point in our signal chain to route either to effects or directly out as well. So let's just play with the settings real quickly here. I'm gonna press play and we'll listen to our kick. Let's start by having a bit of an aggressive ratio just so we hear it and let's bring down the threshold. Very squashed. I'm gonna bring the attack time up a bit. Get a bit of the punch back. And now I'll raise my threshold. And then of course, we've got our output gain as well if we want to level things out again. So you can do the same thing for each of these compressors. If I load up the snare and the clap, go over to compressor number two, which we know is for those two parts, and do the same thing. We've already turned it on. Let's get a little bit of a less aggressive ratio, just a nice little bus compression. 
change our knee, and bring down the threshold. And then we're going to bring up the output gain a little bit to even it out. So we can continue doing this for all the parts to get a nice even sound and add punch on different parts and make everything sit that much nicer in the mix. So finally, when building your own custom drum kits on the MC-707, instead of using just the preset sounds that come internal, you can load your own samples off of the SD card. The way we do that is by going to our top level menu and selecting any pad like we did for other settings, pressing enter, and instead of going to pad edit this time, we're gonna go to instrument select and preset is where we loaded the preset sounds. But if we go down to wave file, this is very similar to a tone track we're gonna bring up our browser for our SD card. And if I go to one of my folders here, I can listen to a bunch of different samples that I have in here. Let's pick this one. And as before, if we wanted to edit it before, we could do that. Let's just import this because I think it's loud enough. So because we have this pad highlighted, we're loading into this pad. So now let's take a listen. Great. Now this is a sample recorded outdoors. So you can kind of hear some birds and some air and stuff like that. So let's go into our settings right here, as long as we have our pad selected and change the release. It's a little too loud. Let's turn it down and let's record it in. Tuning it up a little bit differently and change, changing the course tune. And remember, our reverb settings are individual per part. So the fourth and final type of track available on the MC-707 is a looper track. Now the looper track is an audio looper that takes an audio source either from external, like analog input, over quarter inch cables or external via USB audio from a PC, as well as being able to record any internal sources, so individual tracks or a full mix. So first what we want to do is set up a new track as a looper track. So no different than a tone or drum track, we're gonna press select on any unused track and we're just gonna cursor over to looper. Now loopers behave a little bit differently because they don't have your traditional kind of note step sequencing. As you'll see later in the videos, we can do motion recording on loopers and get some pretty interesting types of results with that. But right now, let's just look at how they work fundamentally as an audio looper. So the first thing we're gonna wanna do is have our input sources set up. What I'm going to be doing is using a JU-06A here, and I've got it simply just MIDI synchronized to the MC-707. So I've got a sequence on the JU-06A. We'll take a listen if I press play. Now I have this going into the external input of the 707. Now let's take a look at our input settings. First thing to do is press shift and input. Now in this menu, we have a few settings. The most important that we wanna look at right now being record source and record measure. So record source right now is set to external, which is what we want for the external input. You can also set it to PC, and then here we see each individual track and the mix out. So we can resample a loop if we want, and we'll take a look at that in just a minute. But let's start by recording a few measures of the JU-06A through the external input. We always wanna make sure that our external in volume is up when we're recording external sources. So anytime we have the input button pressed or on this menu, we can use the value encoder to set that level. So I'm gonna record four measures. So what I'm doing here in my input settings is saying what my default length of recording for a looper is going to be. So now this is set up the way I want, and I do want the external end to be set to stereo because the JU-06A has a lovely chorus in it, and I want that to come through. Let's turn that chorus on, and now we have a clip selected up here. No clip exists yet, but as you can see, I want to record into the very first clip on track two. Now I can select that via the screen here or by pressing the clip button 
And here we see a window of two rows of different clips for each of the eight tracks. So either way we select what clip we want is going to be just fine. So I'm selected on there. Now, if we want to start recording our looper track, let's take a look at how we want to do that. It's really no different than real-time recording. So all I want to do when I have that clip section selected is press record. And as soon as I press record, you can see that a clip is now grayed out and it is active. So I just created a clip like this. And since we are using such a simple setup, which is already MIDI synced, I know that as soon as I press play, this will start playing and we will start recording on the MC-707. So the audio that you hear coming from the JU-06A will be recorded into our looper track. Now let's take a listen and record. Any changes we do in real time will of course be recorded as well. So now that we've recorded those four bars, let's turn down the volume of the JU-06A so we know that we're just hearing the MC-707. So this looper track now has that four bar loop from the JU-06A. So from there, we can edit these looper tracks and manipulate them in a few different ways. So what we wanna do, just like tone tracks and drum tracks for editing our sound, is press shift and sound. And you see that we have a bit of a different menu than we would for our tone and drum tracks. So if we take a look at looper settings, We've got level, we've got what type of pitch stretching we want to do, and we can do things like reverse to get more creative with this. But the pitch menu, if we go over to the right, is where things start to get really interesting because we have real-time time stretching while we're changing the pitch. So you'll notice that the timing isn't changing, but we're able to change the pitch. Now we're able to assign lots of these parameters to knobs as we'll look at later on in the video. So let's go ahead and add a second looper track, this time pulling audio from the SD card, so some pre-recorded material. So I'm gonna just create another looper track like we did with the first, press select, select a looper, and instead of recording in or doing any kind of um, external settings or anything like that, we're just gonna press sound just like we were loading up a preset on a drum or a tone track. And let's select WAV file. And here, we're back at our browser for our SD card. So let's go into breaks and I'm gonna select this drum break. So I'm gonna press enter and it's loaded into the project. And what you'll notice is that regardless of the original BPM of my source material, it's going to auto stretch to the tempo of the track. Let's take a listen. Right, so we have all those same settings available that we looked at for the, uh, for the first looper track we did. So if we go shift and sound and we go to our settings, let's take a quick listen to what changing the chromatic pitch of this drum loop will be like. Very effective to get nice different drum tones. However, it's always locked into that same BPM. Now let's take a quick look at the editing menu for the loopers. So going back, shift and sound, and then we're gonna select edit. So this is a familiar menu. It's a similar kind of waveform readout and editor that we would have had on samples for our tone tracks. So we're able to change the start and end point of the loop. However, we need to be aware that this is going to be changing the length, therefore changing the time stretching. So if I just go ahead and change the end point with our synth part, we're going to hear that the beat will be off. It's automatically time compensating for the length, which is very powerful. And it works very well if we do something like cut it directly in half. So if I zoom in and I wanna cut my break right in half, let's zoom right in and I get a nice clean cut right here. Clean enough. And I play back. We've got essentially 
half time. And then I'm gonna go ahead and zoom back out, change that back, press play again, and we're back at our original BPM and time stretching. Looper tracks can also have MFX on them. So this gets really interesting when you start to play around with the different pitching and timing of the looper plus effects. So let's jump back over to our sample of the JU-06A on looper track number one. So that's track two here. So if I wanna go into our sound settings, shift and sound, let's go over to MFX. And just like any other types of tracks, we've got effects in here. All 90 effects, same as a tone track, same as a drum track. So let's get something maybe a little bit um, extreme. Let's move over to some cool delays. Let's do a reverse delay on this and see how it sounds. Very cool. So it's already getting this cool kind of movement. Let's play around with a bit of the settings here. A little bit more feedback. Let it cloud up a little bit more. A little bit less. All right. So in addition to this, let's go into our settings for this looper track. And we're gonna change the pitch of this as well. So I'm gonna put that pitch down. And I will also change my stretch window to give it a very kind of heavy granular type sound. And I'm gonna reverse it. So we've got a pretty wild sound going on right now. Why don't we try it pitching it up a little bit too? And you can hear that the reverse delay effect is after all of these sound settings. So putting it back to zero, let's take a look at how we can use material from the inside of the 707 for a new looper track. So let's add just one more looper track. And first, let's take a listen to how this is all sounding together. All right, so it sounded pretty cool. So let's add one more looper track and we'll see what we can do with those two tracks as source material. So again, press select on an empty track, looper track, and here's where, just like when we were recording the JU-06A, we want to set what our loop recording source is. So let's go back to our input menu, shift and input. So instead of recording an external source right now, what we want to record is the full mix because I want to record the drums and the funky synth sound that we just made. So record source is mix out and let's record four measures, all right? So now that's all set up, just like before, I'm gonna select one of the clip destinations there, press record, and let's have at it. So now I'm turning these true tracks down and we've got both recorded as audio here, which can then be manipulated just like any other type of looper track which really leads to a lot of interesting sound design, kind of cool rhythms that you might not have thought of, pitched drums, and a bunch of really creative tools for you to use. Once you have an interesting looper track, or just any looper track that you've committed to the memory of the MC-707, you're able to export that as a WAV file for use later in another project with a computer or however you'd like, just to have that WAV file available to you. The way we do that is through the edit screen. So if I hold shift and sound, and let's deal with this final loop that we made. And I'm gonna go over to the edit screen. And remember we had three different areas that we can access along the bottom. The third of which can allow us to normalize our loop and export our loop. So if I press export, we can see up top, it's exporting the audio right now to the SD card. And we're going to be able to access that in a folder called export on the SD card at a later date. Throughout the MC707 signal chain, there is a lot of tone shaping capabilities and a large part of that is equalizers. So if we take a quick look at a tone track like we did earlier on in the video, we'll see on the menu towards the right side, 
EQ. And so what this means is that every partial has its own equalizer to shape the sound before it goes to the final output. So if we take a listen here, I want to turn on my EQ. I'm able to shape the mid range, the highs, cut some highs out, and start to kind of massage the sound to get it the way I want it. So if we press enter on the EQ icon, we move into the advanced partial editing mode, which also applies to EQs. Pressing the function button on the top level menu allows us to change the frequency of each EQ and the Q, the resonance of the mid-range EQ. So the same thing is true for drum tracks. If I pull up a very simple drum track here, and I go to our editing mode, of course, shift and sound. If I move over to any of the pads, press enter, and then move to pad edit, you'll see that every single drum pad has its own equalizer as well. Not just tone shaping from changing the frequency or changing the content of each pad, every single pad has its own equalizer, which really just in addition to the compressor, and the six compressors on the Drum Plus Comp tracks gives you a huge amount of control over dynamics and, and frequency ranges of all your drum parts. So you can switch a different EQ for each of these sounds. And not only that, when you want to go one step further, after you've done your partial EQs on your tone track or your individual pad EQs on your drum track, every single track itself has its own EQ. So once you've tuned up your drum kit just the way you want, if you're working within a mix and you wanna change the whole drum kit, you can do that as well. Let's bring up a few parts and we'll have a play with the EQ of drum kit on track one. I get to these EQs by pressing shift and the select button. And these are some general track settings, but if I go over to the second menu, I have an EQ and I can turn it on and start to play around. So we're just affecting this drum part. Raised a bunch of low end, a bit too much. Let's turn it down. Maybe I want to add a little bit of a bump around 7K, 8K to brighten it up in the upper mid range. And that's being applied to every single drum part. So this menu for the track EQ is available on all types of tracks, including looper and tone tracks. So in addition to the EQs on every single track, on the partials and the drum pads, every single track has its own MFX. Now the MFX sections on the MC707 are extremely deep. There's 90 effects that can be chosen from for any track and I'll show you how to get to those. Let's first take a look at a tone track. So we'll use this Celeste groove here. So if I go into my sound editing, shift and sound, I wanna move over to the final little stop box icon and I can access some settings from the top menu here. First, I wanna switch the effect on and now I can start taking a look through any of these effects. So something like step filter, enhancers, phasers, lots of phasers, ring modulators, moving on to delays, multi effects, and you name it. So if I press enter while I'm selected on this effect, I get to the deeper settings for the effect. So this trem chorus, I've got control over the chorusing rate, either in Hertz or like a lot of other effects in the MC707, I can set it to be synced to a division of the time. Then you've got your tremolo rate, all this kind of stuff right in there in the more in-depth menus. So if you keep looking through the different types of effects, you'll see that there's emulations of classic Roland gear as well. For an example is a Juno 106 chorus, and you'll notice that there's a bit of noise introduced to that. So that's emulating the noise of the original Juno chorus being analog. We can turn that noise off if we want, or we can turn it 
way up for extra lo-fi goodness. There's also a couple modes in here. So all of the settings in these effects are extremely deep and can lead to some very powerful tone shaping. So that's a tone track. Let's leave that one going. Drum tracks, we covered briefly in terms of the output routing, but just to drive it home, if we press shift and sound on a drum track and we scroll over to MFX, we have the same type of options, all 90 effects available here. Things like overdrives are really great on drums. And remember, if you wanna take another look at the drum programming video and the drum editing section, you're able to omit certain parts from that effect. So take my kick out from the overdrive or just send my kick through the overdrive, that's up to the artist. So let's go ahead and turn off the effect. It's a very quick way if we scroll to this little checkbox and turn left, we're gonna turn off the effect. That's nice if you wanna leave your settings and just turn it on later. And finally, on a looper track, same thing. Shift and sound will take us to this menu where we do our looper settings, which we've seen, our looper editing, which we've seen, and then finally, MFX. So just like the other types of tracks, we can move through, select what we want, something like a super filter, maybe a multi-mode filter, and this is great for rolling off a little bit of low end, adding some character to something like a drum break. High pass filter is great if you want to layer a drum break with some 808s. And that high pass filter is really nice for taking out that low end. And if you want, you can assign, as you'll see later on in the video, different types of controls to the control knobs. And then I can play with that filter manually. So on the MC-707, there are also master effects. So let's take a look at the options that we have for that. In the top right of the machine, we've got four buttons. One of them is very important for live performance, and that's the on button. So whenever I have one of these three buttons selected, that is reverb, delay, or multi, these knobs here are in effect. For something like a multi effect, which we'll take a look at in a second, it gives me hands-on control in real time of that effect. So here we've got a DJ style filter. Low pass to the left, high pass to the right. So our cutoff is here and our color or resonance is here. And as soon as I press the on button, turn it off, now these are not affecting anything in real time and I've turned my master MFX off. Same type of behavior if I select reverb, you'll be able to see on the screen, this is controlling reverb time and reverb level. Delay is controlling delay time or division and delay feedback. So a really nice hands-on way to play or program the master effects. Now let's take a look at how we send different tracks to these master effects. The reverb and delay are both what we would call an effects send. What that means is that they don't reside on a track individually, but we have the ability to send any track into those effects to any amount that we want. Now let's take a quick look at how we do that for the three different types of tracks that we're working with generally. So for a drum track, as we covered in the drum editing video, if you go to the editing window and go to settings, which is your whole kit settings, you have delay and reverb send. So let's turn up the delay send. And we're not hearing anything yet. So what that means is that we don't have any individual pads sent to the delay. So it's really useful, as I described earlier on, to have a master effect send, but you can omit certain parts if you'd like. So let's take a look at our clap settings. And all of these delay and reverb send settings are on the top menu of our editing window. So just to review, shift and edit, shift and sound, 
Each pad has its own settings and you can see reverb is on the top menu and delay is on the secondary menu when we press the flashing function button. So let's send the clap to delay. Very slowly, we'll turn it up. There, we can hear only the clap was being sent to delay. So just to reiterate, you wanna set your individual pads, individual parts of the drum kit to the delay in their settings. However, you also need to turn up the master delay send for your kit. Same thing goes for reverb. Now, if we were dealing with a tone track, let's take a look here. And I want to edit that tone track, shift and sound. I can simply go to the mixer menu, which is on the top right of the editing menu. And here we see our delay and reverb send. Nothing more than that, very straightforward. If I want this to go to delay, let's turn that up. There, it's going to delay. Let's do that with reverb as well. And remembering we can always be changing our basic reverb and delay settings up here. Here, nice big reverb on there. Very straightforward for tone tracks. Now for looper tracks, we're also able to send to the delay and reverb in the master effects section. The way we get there is by holding shift and sound again. This time we want to go to track settings. So the third page over called knob control is where we can set the level, the pan, and here we see delay send and reverb send. So let's just play around with the looper for one quick second and send it to some reverb. And some delay. So combining these master effect sends with the track effects becomes extremely powerful. You'll find later on in the video, we'll talk about assigning different controls to the control knobs. And I think that a lot of people will decide that having delay and reverb sends on the knobs is a really great way to enhance live performance and also motion recording when we get into that. So now that we've shown how to send individual tracks to the reverb and delay, let's take a look at how to change those reverb and delay settings and their types. Just holding shift and pressing either or, so let's take a look at reverb, will bring us to this menu. And this looks very much like our MFX menu, wherein I can select different types of reverbs, so different reverb engines, and then more specific settings in terms of the types within that engine. So with our Integra 7 reverb, I can have room one or two, there's two halls, and there's a plate. So we're able to really dial in the type of sound that we would want, including pre-delays, reverb time, reverb density, diffusion, and then damping in the low and high frequency. We've got spread and tone, and of course, reverb level. So these are not just your preset reverbs. These are in-depth, completely programmable reverbs and delays. Let's take a little bit of a look at the delay menu. We can either just move over with our cursor to delay or shift and delay if we're not in the menu already. So the only thing I'd like to point out about the delays is that they're not just delays. Within the delay options, you have choruses as well. So you have a few types of choruses, including a CE1, SDD320, and the Juno 106 chorus. You can have that on your master send as well. And then you've got some more standard types of delays and even some multi-effect like delay into the trem. In addition to the reverb and delay in the master effects section, there's also the multi button here, which houses three more important effects and processors. So to take a look at the multi section, let's just hold shift and press multi. And here, what we can see is an MFX. So this is the same engines that are on each individual track. We have that available on the master. So no need to look too deep into this. We've already taken a good look at it, but you have all 90 effects here to choose from with the exact same settings, except in this case, they're applied to the master output. Very, very powerful. So if we stay in this multi effects menu and we move over, we can see that there's also two more options to process the final output or master output. First being a compressor, and this differs from some of the other compressors that we've seen because it's actually a three band 
compressor. So what that means is that we can set, as you can see here, a compressor for the low end, for the mid range, and for the high end. And not only that, we can split where the frequencies start for each. So really, really awesome. If you want to just compress the low end of your track, you can do that. So we call this a multi-band compressor. And here we have three bands to work with on the master output. And then finally, we've got an EQ, another EQ on the master, just for those final touches when you're finishing up a track. So earlier we briefly covered clips and how they hold all your information pertaining to patterns and sequences and your sound information on the MC707. So let's take a bit of a closer look how to start using clips with a new project. So when you open up a new project and select a few sounds, you'll notice that the clip area is completely empty. So we don't have any clips created yet. Now there are a couple ways to create a new clip. The first of which is to use the right side of the menu where you can see create. Now you want to just use the cursor to highlight where you want to put a new clip in. So let's just put a clip on track one, clip space number one. So as you can see, the grayed out area is telling us that we have a brand new clip. Alternatively, an even quicker way to start making music on the MC707 and create a clip, let's just delete the one that we have now, is to simply have that area highlighted and to start sequencing on the 16 sequencer buttons. So as you'll see, I have a drum kit here and no clip. But as soon as I place one note on the sequencer, we see the same result on the main screen and we've created a new clip. So now if I press play, we're already hearing that clip running. So let's do the same thing for a tone track. So I already have a sound picked here on track two have some bass. So let's just do the same quick way to create a clip and just start to sequence right away. So it's very easy to start getting ideas together. Let's elaborate a little bit on that drum beat. Do a little bit of live recording. So let's add one more element to start creating our groove. On track three, I've got another synth sound here. Now let's just create a clip here using our other method by highlighting the empty clip, track three, clip one, create that. And I'd like to set up some live recording. So now I've got quantize turned on and record turned on. I'm gonna press play and it'll keep looping and I can just play in whatever I feel. So as you can see, it's very, very quick to start putting ideas together and those clips are holding some pretty simple sequences right now. However, if I want to start to elaborate a little bit more and maybe create um, an expanded version of one of those sequences, looking forward to creating a t like a whole song or um, different versions of that clip to be different sections of a song or a live set, we've got a lot of options on the right side of the menu here to start dealing with clips. We've got sound, clip settings, which we'll look at briefly copy and paste. So let's take a look at those right now. If I wanted to copy one of these clips, all I need to do is select copy, press the encoder, and now that's in our copy buffer. So if I move down to another clip, I can say I want to paste it simply by moving the encoder to paste. And you'll notice that you have some options for how you're pasting. Do you want to paste just the sound, which is just your uh, tone information on this track, or just the phrase, which is your sequence information on the track, or all. Let's go all. So essentially what we've done is we've created a second clip on track three. And at the moment, it's the exact same because I copy pasted it. But what's great about working this way is that I can now elaborate to create the next section of this synthesizer part for my song. So let's just do a little bit more live recording um, and we'll add another part to this. I'm gonna go ahead and just make this 
two bars, two measures instead, like we looked at earlier. Do some more live recording. Very easy. So now what I have is two clips under the same track, each with some different node information. You'll also notice on the right side that we have the option to rename clips. So if I select this, we can simply name the clip to be easily organized to be found later on our SD card if we want to reload it in another project. And once we've saved our projects and we're editing some clips, there's also the option to reload our clip. So if we've made a mistake uh, from something we created in the past, all we need to do is highlight that clip and reload. And then also, of course, if we want to delete a clip, we just select delete and press the encoder. Like so, confirm, and it's gone. Launching clips on the MC707, there are a few different ways to do that. As you can see, when we have multiple clips, I'm gonna go ahead and copy my drum part and paste it on the second clip area. As you can see, the grayed out clips on the screen are the ones that are currently active. If I hover over the second clip and press enter, that means that I'll be playing that clip. Let's make it a little bit different from the first one, just like we did with the tone track previously. Let's just add 16 hi-hat hits like this. So if I rock back and forth between the two drum parts, there's the first one, and here's the second one. So that's all well and good. I can fire them off using the cursor and the enter button, by the screen. However, if you want to get more hands-on and a little bit more in a performance type of mode, simply change pad mode to clip. And what you'll see is a, the 16 pads along the bottom are windowing different sections of our main screen. So if you take a look at the main screen, you can see we have a clip in the first slot of track one, two, and three, and a second clip on track one for a different drum part. Now, if we take a look down on the pads, you can see that's reflected. And if I want to, I can select which clip is playing via the pads here. So let's take a look at how to do that. I'm just gonna play the first row of clips all together. And when I want to switch to the next clip on the drum track, just press it and it'll launch on the next downbeat. So when moving from one clip to the next on the MC707, you might wonder, well, when does one clip end and the other clip begin? Now, this is actually a very important setting that we can customize. By pressing shift and tempo, we get to the master clock settings. If we take a look here at step length, essentially what this is saying is, what is the resolution of launching a new clip? So if I press on one of my buttons down here in clip mode, or if I highlight a clip on the screen and press enter, when is that gonna come in? And why is it important when that comes in? Well, there's a few different things that you can consider for that. Maybe you're performing live and you want to set up a clip to launch, but you wanna do a little bit of a, a knob twist kind of move before, so you wanna give yourself a little bit more time to play around before that clip launches. Now, let's take a look at this step length and we're gonna change it to 64. So this is actually four measures instead of one measure. And what you'll notice when we do the same thing that we did before, switching from clip one to two, is that when I press play, it's essentially starting a clock that is gonna wait until four bar markers to launch the next clip. So that's our 64 steps equals four measures or four bars. And after the downbeat, we won't be able to have any changes until that four bar marker. Let's take a look. So I press it, and as you see, we're passing downbeats, and here's our last measure. Then it changed. Now this is really great, as I mentioned, for freeing up your hands or you know any, anything else you want to be doing on the MC707 live before that hits. A good, a good uh, example would be maybe muting a kick drum to add a little bit of you know, hesitation before the next part comes in. So there are many settings for each individual clip that we can change on the MC707. So what I'm gonna do is just copy my clip on track two and my clip on track three and duplicate them like we did previously and then take a look at some of those settings. So track two, let's go copy, paste, paste all, and then track three, same thing, copy, 
Simple as that. And paste all. So now, as you can imagine, the second clip is the same as the first for track two and track three. So let's take a look at some of the settings that we have on our clip edit mode. So to get into clip editing, let's hold shift and press clip. And we see we have shuffle per clip, transpose per clip. Now let's try that out. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight my second bass part and my second synth part and press play. Let's take the drums out. So if I go shift and clip on my bass clip, let's transpose that up. So now I've transposed it up five semitones, and I'm also going to do the same for the synth part. So shift, clip while I have the synth part highlighted, and transpose that up five. So now we've essentially transposed both up a fourth. And this is great for moving to a different section of a song in a traditional kind of electronic music transposing sequences is a really big part of that sound. So if I switch now with my clip mode on the pads back to the originals and I'll bring in the drums, you'll see we have some key changes coming. Just like that. So already we're starting to get the vibe of two different sections of a song. And they can be freely launched with the clips down here or up here on the menu. Let's take a look at some of the other settings. We're going to take a look at just the synth part right now. So we've got our clip highlighted, shift, and clip. Let's take a look at step length. Now you may notice that there are some of the settings here that are mirrored in one of the menus that we took a look at earlier. Let's clarify that for just one second. When we're looking at our measure settings, those also apply to clips because really the measure is holding note information inside the clips. So if I take a look at shift and measure, you'll see that we have step length and scale, mode forward or backwards, and shuffle. So some of these are doubled in our clip settings. So we see step length, scale, direction, and all of those settings. So transpose is really one of the main things that we can get at in the actual clip edit that we can't see in our measure edit. So if we play in the clip menu with scale, we're going to have a similar result that we had when we were in the measure menu earlier. So I just changed the scale of our synth part to 1 8. So it's going to be moving at, moving at half speed, excuse me. There we go. So it brings a whole different life to that sequence. And just like shifting things around like we looked at earlier in the video, these are really great ways to get more creative and pull the most out of the material that you've already made. If we want to keep on this idea of working with the material we have and changing it and morphing it to something new, there's a really powerful setting called first and last step. Now the way we get there is by holding down shift and right under the motion record button we see last. Now we're dealing with this sequence here on track three. And what I'm able to do is change the first step, essentially changing the length of the sequence, but windowing it like this. So as you can see, as soon as I engage first switch on, now I can change the first step of that. And now we've got this kind of cool, almost offbeat, different rhythm going above our other parts. So I can do this exact same thing for last step. And as you can see, you can just kind of jam along with this and get some different kind of ideas. So while you're running your music like this, changing your sound settings at the same time as changing the notes, you really get into a nice groove of getting creative in a much more hands-on way than you would, you know, producing music um, with, with, uh, with other types of gear. So the MC-707 lets you get very, very hands-on and get inspired from all these different types of tools that are inside. Something really interesting is that instead of just changing 
the length back to where you were originally, you can simply turn off the first and last step switch. All right? And whenever I want, just turn those back on. So that allows you to get some really neat different ideas. One of the most powerful aspects of the MC-707 is that every clip on one track can have a different sound on that clip. And this is different from a typical DAW or software style composing and performing, wherein one track generally holds one VST instrument, and every MIDI section is simply different note information. It's important to set up the MC-707 to do this type of function early on in your project before you start to sequence because it changes a few things behind the scenes. So let's take a look at how we can apply a different sound for every single clip. So I'm gonna create a couple tracks really quickly. Let's do a drum track on track one, and on track two, let's do a tone track. If we scroll all the way up to the top to select the entire track, in the same way that we did when we were deleting tracks earlier on in the video, you'll see along the right side, we have settings. Now, if I press the encoder, our first menu here has the option for sound source. Now, I'll point out that you can also get to this menu by holding shift and pressing the select button on the track you'd like. Sound source, by default, is set to track, which means we have one sound source, one instrument for the entire track. However, what we need to do is switch this to clip. Now, every time I select a new sound on a clip area, I will be able to have an independent sound. So let's pull up, just like we would starting a new project, a drum kit on clip one. Let's just pull up an 808 kit. So let's set up just a really quick sequence here on the drum track. So here we have our 808 kit on the first clip with a very simple sequence. Now let's move down to the second clip and create a new clip. Now for our second clip, when we press sound, we can load up a completely different kit than we have on the first clip. So let's go to a TR-727 kit. And we want to select that clip. So we've got all that classic Latin percussion in there. So let's just do a very quick sequence on this one as well. And if I go back to our first clip, let's use our pads down here. You'll hear that the 808 kit will be reloaded. Simple as that. And back. So let's move on to track two, our tone track, and we'll do the same thing that we did for the drum track. So selecting the first clip, we'll create one like this. And we're gonna remember to go all the way up to the top to settings and change our sound source to clip. Very important that we do this first. So let's select a sound for clip one. Let's do this polysynth here. Arm to record, I've already created a clip, let's go. So let's do the same thing that we did for our drum track and create a second clip on the tone track with a completely different sound. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a clip on the second slot there and press sound. You'll notice that we've loaded a default sound again, which is just the initial sawtooth wave. And this is gonna be the case when you create a new clip in this mode, when sound source is set to clip, it will always default to an initial patch. So let's press clip. Go to preset and we'll select a synth bass this time for contrast versus the polysynth. Perfect. So let's arm to record. We've already created our clip. Now let's take a listen to these two sections that we've created with completely different settings for each. 
Now when I go to the second tone track, you'll hear the bass. Perfect. And if I want to add that percussion instead of my drums, let's take a listen. So you can start to imagine when creating larger projects, you've got eight tracks and every single clip on each track can have a completely different sound. So the sonic possibilities and variety within just one project are absolutely huge. So another option for clips is to load up a clip that you have saved on another project on your SD card. So the way we do that is by starting with an empty space and just pressing clip. And you'll see that you have the option to look at a project. So I'm on track one. I have my drum sound already set up. What I wanna be doing is loading my clip information for the sequence from another project. So I'm able here on the left side to scroll through different projects that I have saved on my SD card. And then the second level of the menu is choosing which track I wanna pull it from. And then here we have the different clips that I have within that project. So let's pick clip one from project LA Break Groove. Press enter and it's gonna load that into the sequencer. Let's press play and have a listen. So my entire sequence is already done. And this is a sequence that I created on another project. Maybe it's a project I didn't end up finishing, but I really liked the drum beat. Um, or maybe I just want to change it a little bit and I really liked where it started, but I want to edit it a little bit more. So let's go to a tone track, track number two, and we'll do the same thing. Select an empty clip, press clip, project, and we're on the same menu. Now let's go to one of my tone tracks and let's select LA Bass 1. Press enter. And now we've got this clip on track two. Another option for loading up pre-made material on the MC-707 is to load in a MIDI file. So this could be something that you've created in your DAW or on another piece of gear and you've saved as a standard .smf file. If we want to try this on track three, let's do the exact same thing. Start with a blank clip, press clip, and instead of selecting project, we're going to move down to MIDI file, press enter, and this is going to search through the SD card in a menu under Roland Groovebox slash MIDI, and I can put in any MIDI files in there and press Enter when I find the one I want. So C baseline, load it in. So now on track number three, we're gonna have this MIDI file. And this is playing back the notes on the MIDI file, but the sound that I have programmed on track three. Now, if we go back one step to the transposition function that we have for clips, this is a really powerful function when you're loading in something you'd made previously because maybe your previous track wasn't in the same key. So in this case, let's take a listen. We're in E flat. However, this MIDI sequence that we loaded in is in C. So what we can do very quickly, just like we did before, highlight the clip we want, press shift and clip, and we're just gonna go ahead and transpose that from C, C sharp, D, E flat. And now, if we press play, we should be right in line. So once we've populated a bunch of clips on many different tracks in our project, Let's take a look at how we can start to arrange them and organize them in a way that creates more of a song structure or um, more of an interesting kind of movements and different sections. So let's take a quick tour of what we've got here. Got seven tracks set up. Let's take a little listen to each clip very briefly. I've got some drums on track one. Track two, I've got my bass line. Track three, I've got a synth. Track four, I've got a looper track with a drum break. Track five, got a little bit of a percussion loop. Got a 303 line on track six, and track seven, I've got a bit of a riser. So I've created all of these somewhat willy-nilly, just 
one at a time. I think that they're kind of working together, but I've gone ahead like we did previously in the video and made a couple different variations on the drums and on one of the synth parts. So if we take a quick listen to the different variations we have on the drums, let's move down our clips using the pads. The first one, let's go to the second. Very simple, just a hi-hat. And then the third drum clip in a different kind of feel. Let's go back to the first one. All right, I've got a couple different bass lines. Let's take a listen to the first one. And let's take a listen to the second one. A little bit more movement. Same key, same song, just a bit of a different variation. And then finally, the other variation I have is on the synth part on track three. So let's take a listen to those three variations. First one, bit sparse. Second one, I've copied and pasted it and elaborated. Adding little chords here and there. And the third one, same tone, different frequency range, kind of doing a bit of a different type of thing. Nice high plucky sound, right? So that's all we're working with. But even with not a huge amount of different clips, we're able to create different sections of the song. And let's take a look at how we can look at these sections and fire them off and arrange them in different ways. So the first thing I'd like to look at is a very quick shortcut that allows you to launch rows of clips all at one time. So this is a great option if you've started to compose where every row is already a different section. That is that clip one on your drums and your tones moving down the tracks are all supposed to play together. Now, right now, if I play all of this together, it's gonna to be a little bit too jumbled. I think that there's too much going on. Let's take a listen to everything on clip one. And what I want to do to launch these rows is hold down clip. And as you can see, you have the ability to launch any of the 16 rows at once. Now this is a really powerful shortcut. So hold down clip, press one. And as you can see, I've highlighted the entire first row of clips. There's way too much going on there for a section. If I move to number two, Oh, it's, it's, it, there's not too much going on, but that might be a nice interlude or of, of sorts. Number three, whole different vibe. So this is kind of working, but I didn't create these different rows with the intention to have them launched all together. This tool is extremely powerful, however, if you would like to do that. What the MC707 can do in terms of arranging clips together is what we call scenes. Now, what's lovely about scenes is it gives us the ability to combine any clips from any track in the entire project into one section. We're not moving the clips around, we're simply recalling all those clips to play at once together. So there's scene buttons over here on the left side of the MC707, and you see one, two, three, four, and underneath we see five, six, seven, eight. So we have eight scenes to use, and if we want to access five, six, seven, or eight, simply hold shift and press one, two, three or four respectively. The way we commit scenes and save these scenes is really great because we can pick up with what we're doing with our ear. If we hear something we like, a nice combination, then we can save that as a scene. So what I'm gonna do is start to play a few clips and get to a place that I think is a nice first scene. So I like drum clip one. The bass clip one is great. But I don't want this drum break in my first scene. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop that clip. A nice quick way to do that is to press the mute pad mode and simply press the green pad here, which will stop the clip from playing. And you can see that in the screen as the clip is grayed out. Let's take a listen to this percussion part. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that out too. 303, we don't need it yet, let's use it later. And the riser, we don't need that yet either. So as a matter of fact, I like what's happening with just these first three clips. So once I hear something I like, 
all I need to do is press and hold any of these scene buttons or shift and press if I want to use five, six, seven, or eight. And as we'll see on the screen, hold, store scene one. Simple as that. So if I go ahead and launch a whole different row of clips, at any point I could be launching different clips, I could be anywhere within my project. And as soon as I press scene one, it's gonna line up to play the next clip. So there we go. What I created for scene one is already committed there, those first three clips. Now maybe scene two, maybe I want to add in that drum break. Let's take a listen to that. So we can just keep jamming from where we are. I'm gonna go to clip and launch tra track four, which is our drum break. And we'll hear, nice. So a little bit of a variation on where we started. And you know what, let's leave that as scene number two. So while it's playing, or not even while it's playing, but while these clips are selected, I'm just gonna hold down two, and I've stored scene two. So this is a very quick way to launch different sections. So I'm gonna start with scene one by pressing it. Let's play it. And when I wanna add that drum break, all I need to do is line up scene two. Press it. Now knowing that I have variations on some of these synth parts, how about we change track three to the second variation with a bit more chords and all that kind of stuff. So all I'm gonna do is go to clip, choose my second clip on track three, I'm gonna press play. Excellent, that's scene three. We're just moving down the line really quick. So now we've got three scenes stored. So now what I'm gonna do is create a bit of an interlude, a little bit of a, a break on scene four where I wanna use my second drum clip, which is pretty much pulled out everything just but a hi-hat. I like this because the kick drum's gone, so it's creating a whole another section, but I've got this riser sound here to help build up some energy. So I'm gonna put that in. Great. I'm gonna go ahead and save this as scene four. Now we've got four scenes. And let's do one more, which is after this buildup, we wanna kinda of change the groove, go to the really the next big section of the song. Now I'm, I'm gonna find that right now just by jamming. I've saved that so I can launch any clips that I want. Starting to come together. And maybe we can try, you know what? I'm not even feeling the, the part on track five. So let's just stop that and add in our 303 line. Nice. And maybe this is something that I wanna bring in slowly, manually. That's up to me when I decide to play live or record. So let's commit this as scene five. Shift and one, and we've committed scene five. So let's take a little tour through our arrangement that we just created. created. So I'm gonna line up scene one, and let's just watch on the screen as we launch the different scenes. So scene one, let's go. Scene two. Simply just added our drum break in there for another layer. Scene three. Now our chords are changing, so we're kind of moving through different sections. Scene four. Starting to build up the energy. And scene five. Totally different. So as you can see, scenes are a great way to quickly react to something you're hearing as well. If you hear something you like, quickly save it into a scene because you can recall it later, even if you're not 100% sure that's what you want. It's a great way to just pick up on the vibes that you're creating, and if you really like something, just lock it in. So one more very powerful feature on the MC707 when dealing with clips is the clip chain function. Now, what this allows you to do is have automatic changes in clips based on your clip settings. So let's take a look at our drum clips. Now we've got three clips, as we same ones we were dealing with before. And if I highlight my first drum clip, press shift and clip, and we move down, we're gonna see next clip and play step length. 
So what these settings are, are saying when we get to the end of our clip, or when we get to the end of this step length setting, where are we going to move next? So stay is essentially just going to keep looping the clip. That's the default mode. Stop can be very powerful if you want a part to just start at the beginning of, say, one of your scenes, but not to keep looping. Now that's a really nice way to add variation to a scene or one of your clip rows. If we keep going, this is where it starts to get really interesting. I can tell the clip to move to any other clip on that track automatically after a certain amount of time. Now this is a great way to have things moving around by themselves, creating song structures. So let's be very simple here, and we're going to move from clip one, because I am on my setting for clip one. Let's move to clip two, and I'm going to set this to one bar. Now, just to keep things simple. So let's take a look at what we have here. I'm going to press play, and we should see clip one move to clip two on track one. Very simple. Now, that's a little bit short. Let's change it up. Hold shift for greater increments, always. Let's go to 64, so that's four measures. And while we're at it, let's do a setting on clip number two as well. So highlight clip number two, shift and clip. Same thing, so next clip, how about we go to clip three? But this one, I'm only gonna have it set to 32, so just two bars and then we'll see what kind of action this gives us. Automatically move to the second clip, then to the third. So as you can see, when you start doing this for multiple different clips on different tracks, you can build very complex relationships between movements, between clips, certain clips being fired only once, and again, a very powerful way to interact with scenes that you've created as well. So when we start to really dig into these settings for clip chains, it can also affect how our scenes work in some very powerful ways. Some examples being a part of a scene, one clip in the beginning of a scene, only playing for one bar, and you don't have to reach down and make that clip stop playing, it can just stop automatically, or it can move to another clip. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in learning more about the MC707 and other Roland products, make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel.